Hi, this is Ann Vandermeer. I am going to be interviewing my husband, Jeff Vandermeer, who's a New York Times bestselling author of the Southern Reach Trilogy. I'm going to be asking him a bunch of questions while we're here on lockdown in Tallahassee, Florida. Jeff, how are you managing during this lockdown? Um, well, uh, it helps to have uh, this uh, great uh, outside yard that I put a lot of work uh, into in the garden. And then also, it helps to have the king of all cats, Neo, who uh, I talked to a lot more during the lockdown than I did before. Um, <laughs> he doesn't like that. Um, and uh, it, it's it's basically uh, an issue of um, trying to figure out not just uh, how to have mental energy to write when you're stressed, but also what to write. Um, I was working on and am working on a, a near future novel that I think is at the level of detail where you don't need to factor in the pandemic because things are falling apart already. But uh, I won't know until after I finish it just what kind of changes need to be made. The, the other issue, though, is that I think that almost any novelist, unless you're writing far, far future fiction or you're writing historical fiction, there should be some uh, issue or some thing to do with climate change uh, in your fiction, even if it's in the background, because it's everywhere. It's, it's something that's everywhere. And um, I find the coronavirus uh, pandemic fascinating in terms of the response, because, for example, in Florida, we have seen responses that seem more like people think they're fighting World War II uh, or think that it's like fighting a hurricane. And so something about the fact that it's this invisible contamination makes it very difficult for people to get a handle on, you know, what they actually need to do. And um, we've gone hiking in parks that are very remote and yet uh, had, you know, potential problems because other people passing us by, even one or two people, don't seem to want to take safety precautions in part because there's this weird thing to do with uh, politeness. I'm sorry that the screen is a little weird. Don't don't let him do that. The cat is 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 messing with the computer. Um, and uh, so so th so that's 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 an issue too. Um, I think with writing during this time. Well, Jeff, you have had a love relationship with the Czech Republic for a very long time, long before you ever visited. What was it like for you to visit the first time? And what memories do you have that added to the authenticity of your upcoming YA series, Jonathan Lambshead and the Peculiar Peril? Yes, uh, the misadventures of Jonathan Lambshead in the first volume of Peculiar, Peculiar Peril. A large, uh, certain portion of it is set in Prague. And a certain portion, in fact, a large portion of books three and four, uh, which will be also collected in one volume in the US, are also set in Prague. And I just remember we were lucky enough uh, not to come during peak tourist se season, the two times that we visited Prague. And the first time it was that, I know it's a cliche, and I know for people who live in Prague, it may not feel this way, but it was a very magical experience. Uh, we found Svenkmeyer's uh, shop uh, above the castle. Uh, we also, found a little uh, local beer garden that was hidden behind a kind of maze hedge. And there was like a strange music coming out of the maze hedge that was how we found the beer garden. And it was just a place that locals hung out and uh, drank and, and we had an amazing time there. And I really think that uh, a lot of a peculiar peril is influenced by uh, this feeling that at any time in Prague, you could turn the corner and you would find something amazing that you hadn't expected. And I think this was reinforced because we took a train trip from Berlin to Prague. And so we got to see at least part of the countryside. Uh, and then also we did get to visit uh, Pilsen 
uh, on another occasion. And so, uh, and be in a beer cave and a beer spa, <laughs> which are two of the, the best experiences that I've ever had in my life. So uh, all of these things uh, combine. So uh, for example, the magicians of Prague are defending Prague in a peculiar peril against um, a Franco-Germanic uh, empire that's bringing forces against them. And one of the things they do is uh, they create a beer mist so that uh, this mist settles over the opposing army and they all get drunk uh, and they don't realize that they're losing their faculties until too late. And I, th I thought that would be kind of a funny thing, but seemed like the kind of thing that a Czech magician might might do. <laughs> well, you've been writing about the natural world for your entire career, with plants and animals often taking center stage in much of your fiction. Why did you focus on this early on before the rest of the world caught on? What did you get right and what do you continue to struggle with? Mm. Well, I think that uh, growing up, uh, my parents were in the Peace Corps and growing up in the Fiji Islands, in an area of Fiji especially that was very wild, and uh, to just be able to step outside your door and you're immediately in wilderness and nature and jungle and tropical forest, more or less, uh, was extremely... Um, it's just that that's the way I thought the world was. And so when we came back to the U.S. and first we're in upstate New York for two wintry years. Uh, we immediately then moved to Florida to try to again get that feeling back. And so I've always been surrounded by animals. My mother was a biological illustrator until computers took away that job. And my father is an entomologist and research chemist. So the world of different kinds of creepy crawlies and animals was always there. But then in the Ambergris books, it was useful to try to get away from some of the normal ways that fantasy fiction, uh, you know, is, is done by thinking about squid and fungus and what technologies, for example, you would develop if you were focused on fungus, which at the time, to many, sounded very out there. Um, and even though the books are very serious, when I would describe it, sometimes people would think it sounded a little goofy. <laughs> but if you look at uh, the technology and the research being done now, the Ambergris books are actually kind of predictive. Um, they have become predictive science fiction about how we use uh, fungus and mushrooms. So I, I think that's that's been quite fascinating to me. What I continue to struggle with and continue to try to do is put uh, myself in the viewpoint of characters that are not really necessarily always human. they are all been transformed by their environment in some way so that they are part plant or part animal or, or in some other way not human. And uh, that's a struggle because I have to use English and words <laughs> uh, to convey this, uh, and words are a human construct, so uh, you can never totally get it right. So, for example, for dead astronauts, I have a fox as a character, and the fox has been slightly altered by human beings, which allows me to, you know, have a character that has is somewhat relatable in a human way but also kind of alien. But if I was really doing a Fox point of view, it would be a 500 word novel that's just smells because that's how foxes um, communicate and how they think is through smell. And uh, then we as humans would have to wade through 500 pages of smells and try to figure out what the Fox novelist was <laughs> trying to tell us. Your work does have a bit of playfulness in the midst of very serious events. How are you able to balance the humor with the drama? Right. Well, um, I, I learned very early on, without naming names, from writers that I quite admired, that there was one writer in particular who, when he wrote fantasy fiction, even though his work was quite um, dark, the kind of, like, the color 
and the brightness provided by the fantasy setting offset it. And when he wrote, and it wasn't fantasy, but just the real world, it was just too bleak. The, the problem is if you write really dark fiction and there's no relief from it, number one, it feels like it's not um, true to life. So for example, even during this epidemic or pandemic, uh, people are still making jokes. People are still um, finding ways to be upbeat about it. Uh, and I, I find that that's more realistic for one thing about how humans act. Um, and then I just naturally have a sense of humor that ha I haven't always been able to use for some of the books. I mean, there are some books like Authority which is a very dark, but meant to be very funny at times, uh, comment on bureaucracy and definitely in a Kafka-esque kind of way. And then the forthcoming of Peculiar uh, Peril, the, the Misadventures of Jonathan Lambshead, the, the alt-earth world, Aurora, that a lot of the book takes place in, has a wild kind of magic that lends itself to a lot of different kinds of comedy including slapstick, including puns and things like that. There's a scene with a very sarcastic talking carrot and a talking uh, potato who's more sincere. Um, there are giant talking marmots. Um, <laughs> uh, Kafka is uh, amphibious <laughs> in the novel. Charlemagne is resurrected as a giant moth <laughs> and William the Conqueror <laughs> is a giant eel. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't laugh at my own fiction, but, um, and there's a lot of uh, other things that are both horrific and hilarious uh, that, that I think readers will enjoy. Uh, one thing I like to do is have uh, villains turn out or monsters turn out to not be as monstrous as you thought. So there's one monster that you change your opinion on, uh, uh, I think by the end of the novel, in ways that are both very um, sweet, but also very funny. And uh, so in this novel, that novel in particular, the one that's forthcoming, you'll see a lot more of the sense of humor. And um, I have read a lot of Czech fiction and I love the satire. I love the sense of humor and the absurdism. And so a lot of this book, The Sense of Humor, is a nod uh, to those authors that I've read. Well, since we're talking about A Peculiar Peril, your upcoming YA series that features Jonathan Lambshead, this particular series came out of your original groundbreaking anthology, The Thackeray T. Lambshead Pocket Guide to Eccentric and Discredited Diseases, also known as The Fake Disease Guide. With everything that's happening in the world right now, do we need a new updated edition of this anthology? And if so, what would that look like? I don't know if this is the right time to have a new fake disease guide. It was um, kind of horrific enough that after we put out the fake disease guide back in, I think, 2003, that um, one of the diseases that was fake wound up they discovered a disease that had the exact same symptoms as the fake disease. So it no longer read like a fake disease, um, which isn't actually very funny. But what was funny was we would do our readings with everyone dressed uh, up in doctor's uniforms and with beakers on the tables. And uh, it would be something ridiculous like ballistic organ syndrome, which is when the organs in your body decide to just like explode out of you like cannonballs. And there's a scene that one of us non-doctors read uh, where this is used in the defense of Constantinople where they lined up people with this disease. And then they just basically, their internal organs were like cannonballs <laughs> against the Turk. Um, so, um, so, you know, it goes back to the idea that humor can help us in fairly dark times and you can joke about dark things if you do it in the right way. Um, but I'm not sure that this would be the right time for that. But but it is true that that, that gave a very fertile, um, uh, you know, foreground or, or background for writing about Dr. Lambshead's grandson. Well, since we're in a playful mood, I want to talk a little bit about Born. Born is a feature book for the NEA Big Reads program 
here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Some libraries have even created born escape rooms mm -hmm. to celebrate the book. Have you tried one yet? And what do you think about this idea? Yes, there have been more and more uh, escape rooms based on my fiction, especially uh, on Born. And uh, I hate escape rooms for the same reason that I hate the idea of bungee jumping or skydiving, which is to say that I don't want to be in those situations <laughs> until I have to be. <laughs> and so the idea of being in an escape room is horrifying to me, um, unless I'm actually locked in a room that I have to actually escape from. <laughs> seems very claustrophobic and horrifying. So although th they sound both interesting and and bizarre, <laughs> I haven't tried any of the escape rooms that I've um, that, that have been set up on my fiction. Okay, well let's let's go back and talk a little bit about your ambergris work. Your novel Finch takes place in the world of ambergris that you created, but it's a detective mystery. How did you prepare for writing a book that's so different from your previous ones? Yeah, so Finch, I, I've, I, I always read a lot of uh, detective fiction, but I, I wanted to really organically uh, just have it in my bones before I wrote what's basically a noir novel with fantasy elements. And so uh, what I did is I, I went to Publishers Weekly here in the U.S. and I asked if I could be a reviewer for mysteries. And basically what that meant is that they would send me books uh, maybe every couple of months and I would review them anonymously for Publishers Weekly, but I, I didn't pick the books that I reviewed. So over about uh, three years before I wrote Finch, I read almost every kind of uh, mystery and thriller that you can think of, good ones, bad ones, all different. Uh, modes, you know, hard-boiled, uh, <laughs> um, one set in other countries, one set in the U.S., historical ones. And uh, so by the time that I wrote Finch, I had this, like, sedimentary layer of knowledge that I didn't have to, like, research what the tropes are, what the, the things are that you would expect. And, you know, obviously I'd also watched a lot of noir movies, always had, always had been a big fan. And so it, it would have come naturally anyway, but, but I think that that helped. And so when I sat down to write, I didn't do any research on detective fiction. I just focused on being very tight in on the main character Finch's uh, point of view. And uh, I used very different uh, way of writing. I used a lot of uh, sentence fragments and clipped speech and um, uh, got away a little bit from the kind of flowing lyricism of, say, Shriek or City of Saints and Mad Men. And, uh, you know, I think that added a really interesting and, and rich uh, element uh, to this fantasy setting of Ambergris. And it made it more interesting for me rather than writing a trilogy, more or less, or three, you know, three books that are connected but also stand alone uh, in three different styles, basically. And, and Finch was was, um, you know, I found a way, I think, to get really inside a, a character's head. Uh, I was also writing it uh, at, in the aftermath of us, uh, the U.S. Invite, invading Iraq, and I wanted to talk about what occupation means, but I didn't feel comfortable writing directly about Iraq, so those themes are in there, those themes of uh, what do you do if you have to get along with an occupier, uh, that you have to find a way to make a living and yet somehow not compromise yourself. And uh, I thought that was very powerful. And uh, I think that, um, you know, it's still influencing things I'm doing now. It's influencing this thriller that I'm working on now called Hummingbird Salamander, which is a more direct and uh, 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 very much in the moment uh, uh, book uh, thriller with mystery elements. So, so everything I learned there uh, also comes into play in this new book. So, well, I'm glad that you brought that up because that's actually my next question. I wanted to talk a little bit about hummingbird salamander. I heard that you actually had a biologist create a new creature for this book. Oh yeah. How did that come about, and how are you using this new creature? 
Uh, yes, I actually thought it would be more interesting if uh, a biologist created uh, the hummingbird and the salamander of the title, and that I, as a writer, would have to react to the facts she came up with, and the plot and the setting and everything would be affected by uh, the fact that I had no control over them, but they also wouldn't be real, so um, it would be something that would be a little malleable. So it was really fascinating to have to create plot and, and, and uh, situation based on a biologist creating these actual creatures for you. And I've very much uh, been enjoying it. Um, so that's, that's basically what that is. So, so that's what I'm looking forward to and doing next. So thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. And it's great to be able to talk to people in the Czech Republic.